Dog scrolling for October 25th, 2022. I'm Steve Foder. I'm Ghouling Chip Hasselblad. <laughs> We're just a couple of guys sitting around talking about things that are important to us. Hopefully they're important to you. If you need more information, there's so many great ways to find more information. Chip, it is so nice to see you here in studio this week. I am a uh, illusion state that knows how to use a microphone because I set it up for you. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's going to sound so much better this week, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> this is our halloween show this is the last tuesday before halloween Woo, on a monday it's, it's oh. gonna be a monday halloween oh it's the worst when i am the king of the universe halloween is on the last saturday of october period well the cool thing about our area is the kids they wear their costumes when they're in elementary school mm -hmm. and they have a parade around town mm -hmm. and all the business owners and, the, and the, the village employees come out. And I mean, think about it. You're a kindergartner to a sixth grade and you got all these uh, adults just, you know, just clapping yep. for you. What a great time to be a kid. It's joyous. It's awesome. Happy Halloween, everyone. Film at 11. Brings us to our film at 11, our movie of the week. Hey, Chip, did you make it to the movie theater this week? Steve, as a former AMC Stubbs <laughs> member, <laughs> yes, I went to the AMC that I used to go to all the time to see movies. Do they all smile at you and go, oh, Chip's here? Of course they did. Of course, of course they, they did. did. They clapped me as I walked in. And I didn't quite have a um, a showing that I was my personal showing. It was me and probably five or six of my best friends <laughs> going in to the IMAX theater. Steve, I saw this in IMAX. Oh wow, the IMAX presentation! You got to see the new movie Black Adam this week. Yes, I did, Steve, and it stars that guy from Fast and Furious. <laughs> oh, it's all about family. It is about family, Steve. <laughs> this I, I thought it was the guy from Moana. It could be. <laughs> It could be. Yes. A, a former football player. <laughs> yes. The XFL owner. Yes. Yes. Dwayne that, the Rock Johnson. He's a wrestling, Steve. He's, he's a wrestling. Was how was this movie? I, I I I will see this movie eventually. All right. So for those who are not familiar with who Black Adam is, because he's not a household name like Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman, he is a, a character that was bought by DC Comics. And he was part, uh, he was the bad guy for Captain Marvel, Shazam. Shazam! Exactly. <laughs> and so what ended up happening is when, when DC bought this character a long, long time ago, they really struggled to figure out where to put this character into the DC universe. I mean, you already have Superman, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the 90s, I guess, uh, somebody said, well, why don't we make the bad guy, Black Adam, sort of a uh, anti-hero got it he's from the middle east he's uh, a good guy when he needs to be a good guy but you know he's got his own uh defense of of, of his area and culture okay. and stuff like that all right this is a very good strategy by the writers at that time and made the character something important and i think that that is where um this film kind of fits in is that the, the DC movies have really struggled to create this universe and kind of build upon each other. It was really, really dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no, that's all out of the way. And, and for the people who are interested in this uh, movie, this is a great jumping off point because what this will show is that they can build a universe. Uh, around this and they totally set it up at the end don't worry about it um but the 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 initial part of it is that that dwayne johnson and his creative team they want to take over they want to say we will create the movies the new aquaman movie the new flash movie the new wonder woman movie the new superman movie we want to be the creatives behind it okay and i think they get the characters so could they do it? Absolutely. And is this movie really dark? No, it's not. Hmm. But this movie is a total action film. Yeah. And it is a comic book story. This is not a deep story. It starts out with explosions 
and fight scenes and more explosions. And then the uh, Justice Society shows up. And guess what? They've got to stand off against Black Adam. And there's fights and there are explosions and there are things that get destroyed and there are misunderstandings, but they come together at the end and they beat the bad guy. I mean, it's not a deep story. At right. All. Um, but they do a pretty good job at it. They do a good job at sort of reinventing the characters. So you're going to be introduced to Hawkman and Dr. Fate and all these other characters. They do a great job at sort of making this um, movie come together. There isn't a lot of backstory. I mean, you get the backstory of Black Adam, but it's revealed sort of as it needs to be revealed. Okay. But those other characters, they just kind of show up and they just do what they have to do. Interesting. So this is all action. It's certainly if you're a 13 year old boy and this is something you're interested in, aimed at you. Um, I don't think it's going to age particularly great. Um, but the deal is, is, is it of the zeitgeist of the moment? Certainly. Mm -hmm. They did a pretty good job. I'll say 50 out of a hundred okay. for it. This is not going to change anybody's world. Um, and certainly if you're not interested in superheroes, it probably isn't going to interest you too much. And that's one of the conversations that we've had for a few years now is, are we past the superhero era of filmmaking? It, it, it could be yeah. because I think that we've seen it mm -hmm. and this story isn't any different than anything you've seen before. Is it, um, better? Maybe I, this is not a deep film. Okay. Um, and it is, it is uh, fast food for the moment. It's not nourishment. You're not getting any grand stories or anything like that. It's about going through it. And Dwayne Johnson is certainly charismatic. Mm -hmm. They certainly made him the anti-hero that this character is. And they certainly set it up that if there was some big story to tell, there is. But they're not revealing anything. And it's not like, they're like they've set up some Thanos bad guy or anything like that. No, they've set it up so there can be a next film and a next film and a next film. And they can all kind of connect to each other, but only connect enough that they need to connect to mm -hmm. each other. And like Fast and Furious films, they're just they're just something to consume. All right. Uh, that, that's not a great review, but it seems like you had enough of a good time watching this that you could say this is in that vein of those superhero movies. If you like those, you'll like this. Yeah. And, and I'm, I don't, I didn't particularly enjoy it. I mean, okay. it's, it's not, it's, but then again, I'm not the audience. Okay. I am, Fair. I am the old guy that's seen it. Yeah. But it, like I said, if you're a 13 year old, Maybe this is right up your alley. Maybe this is something that could be of interest to you. Okay. Um, the the only moral of it was the people of the Middle East of this uh, artificial country they've created. Um, they just want to defend themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, then Black Adam is going to be the guy who's going to defend their interests. Interesting. Yeah. All right. I got a chance to see the Monsters movie on Netflix. This is the Rob Zombie 2022 reimagining of our favorite monsters in in a fish out of water story. In Technicolor, Steve. Aha. Uh -huh. Here's where the reviews really get interesting. This movie was released in full color, and I am absolutely sure that that was a mistake, that this film was shot for black and white. So tell me about that. Yeah. The, the thing about shooting in black and white, I have studied filmmaking for a very long time and the film like, uh, clerks that's in black and white young Frankenstein that's in black and white. They made very, very serious choices about lighting and color when they were shooting for black and white. Rob zombie did the same thing with this. This set is lit for black and white. There are blue lights and green lights and red lights that don't make sense for the storytelling only make sense in black and white. So it kind of gives it maybe a garish look and and one of the things that really bothers me about Frankenstein's monster is the representation of that creature as green. He should not be green. He should look like he is dead. The skin of that creature should look like it is decaying, not green. They shot these films in black and white and used green makeup in order to make 
the skin look pale in black and white. Interesting. Aha. Uh-huh. So the first thing I did before I pressed play on this movie on Netflix was I adjusted the color of my TV to black and white. You can do that, Steve? Yes. That was that was a big discussion on Facebook, wasn't it? Was you can do that? You can adjust the color on your TV? Yes. Yes. I'm here to tell you, please don't watch this movie without adjusting your TV to black and white first. This is not a bad movie. This is good storytelling. This is a group of people who really love the old TV show, The Munsters, the silly, campy sitcom that it was, and putting that into 2022 really really worked well for me so it was a modern take of of the monsters it is but it isn't they are a fish out of water they are people outside of time there is no time period in this movie some of the cars are certainly 60s cars some of the phones are certainly 60s phones we don't have modern you know cell phone service it's all the old 60s version of that but there's still that that modern sensibility of who these characters are and how they're treated as the outsiders in the situation i watched a, a video or maybe i read a story this week about fred gwen the original gentleman who played uh herman uh, monster, monster. Uh huh. so herman monster the character he was doing an imitation of his mom. Interesting. So it explains it. It explains his oh, mannerism. Interesting. The mannerisms were of his mom. I I am intrigued. I would like to know where you got that information because I, I would like to have that information from its source as well. I'll, I'll have you look that up later. This is a good movie. I recommend this movie to anybody who loves the monsters. There's not much Rob Zombie parts to it the only rob zombie pieces are some of the music uh his wife plays lily munster and and that is um, my least favorite part of this movie she does she does not do a great job as an actress here and her song that she gets um is is very skippable okay (laughs) i do not enjoy her singing or her acting but other than that Sylvester McCoy is in this one as Igor and he boy oh boy does he put on the schlocky silly sitcom monsters he he does all face acting and it was just a joy to watch and how about uh grandpa grandpa was fine grandpa was fine he's definitely doing an impression of the original grandpa from the monsters and 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 I wish that he would do some other rendition of that character, but it works. It works fine. Turn your TV to black and white. Excellent. Steve, you got to revisit a a movie that you've seen a couple times so far. Yeah. Clerks three. Speaking of black and white movies that I love clerks three is not in black and white. Well, actually parts of it are that one came out on digital this week. And yes, I plunked down my money to watch this movie again. I love what Kevin Smith has been able to do with these characters over the last 30 years. And this movie stays true to who these characters are and gives us just a a beautiful picture of grief and how the pain of loss works for these characters who I really identify with. I, I really see myself as one of or maybe both of the clerks being as a video store employee 30 years ago and now entering a different stage in my life. Oh, excellent. Steve, let's talk about a bunch of new movies that maybe we won't say. Yeah, it is Halloween weekend. There's lots of scary movies hitting our theaters this week. The first one is called Pray for the Devil, P-R-E-Y, get it? Pray for the Devil. This is the story of a nun who who's performing an exorcism. This is very much on that list of exorcism movies, just like The Exorcist. This one features Virginia Madsen. And it's very Catholic. Yes. All right, Steve, let's go to the next 
horror film. Yes, we have a Friday the 13th fan film coming out this week. This is My Special Boy, a movie about reopening Camp Crystal Lake and and just in the face of any of that, you know those stories about that Jason guy. We're going to open this camp. We're going to have fun. Interesting. This is a fan film about Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Steve, let's go to the next uh, horror film. The Lair. This one is a Royal Air Force pilot. He was shot down over Afghanistan. This looks like a Jedi who has a very short uh, lightsaber, Steve, <laughs> and they're going to fight a bunch of uh, you know, monsters. Monster movie. Appetite for Sin is our next one. This is a horror feature film about the story of women vampires walking the streets of Los Angeles. I wonder why they got the idea to have it about Los Angeles. This looks like a real winner, Steve. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Call Jane is a movie that we have talked about before. This is the story of a woman who has an unwanted pregnancy and in America trying to find her way through that situation. And it stars Elizabeth Banks. That's right. Steve, let's go to something that you'll end up seeing with Mystery Science Theater 3000. To say I'm excited for the October Mystery Science Theater is an understatement this is the first mystery science theater in 3d 3d have you heard about 3d it, it's it's this new technology that they have they have shipped us paper 3d glasses blue and red glasses it's shipped to everybody that supported the kickstarter and we are going to watch a 3d movie this week this is the mask from 1961 so this will star of cameron diaz and Jim Carrey. Smoking. <laughs> I, I, I imagine that there are so many jokes about the Jim Carrey mask movie in the riff of this movie from 1961. This is definitely not that movie. This is definitely one of those schlock 1960s movies trying to get people to pay money to see a dumb movie because of the special effects of 3D. And interestingly enough, even as crazy as this um, trailer was, <laughs> Where it's like, folks, show up, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, this looks far better than most of the movies that we've discussed so far. It reminds me of the William Castle movies. We watched The Tingler on Sven Gulli a week or so ago. And those schlock ideas of coming into the theater, a very, very special presentation, The Mask. The Tingler it sounds something adult, Steve. Yes, there is definitely... <laughs> something to the tingler book it 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 brings you to our book it our book of the week and it is the end of the month chip well, you know what that means, Steve. I do know what that means. Do we, you know what that means? That means our brain cells can increase. That's right. Pam Bedore is here for the end of the month. Our Halloween read along The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. How are you, Pam? Oh, I'm so good. And I'm so excited to see you guys. Hello. 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 Welcome to the end of October. Next Tuesday is the first of November. Halloween is on a Monday. So this is our Halloween show. This is our Halloween show. And then we have to remember, remember, yeah, something in November, right? <laughs> <laughs> I always have a hard time remembering Memorial Day. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> the Haunting of Hill House, Pam. This was written in 1959. Shirley Jackson, one of one of those writers that that is really held up as as a beacon of writing. Yeah, Shirley Jackson um, is really one of the sort of 20th century Gothic writers, and so. She's she's really well known. I mean, her most famous story is probably the lottery, which I think both of my kids have read in, in middle school. It's very commonly taught. Is that taught at your school too, Steve? I, I okay. The short answer is yes. The long answer is I'm not even sure what's in the anthology of middle school nowadays. Yeah. It might have been taken out, but yes, as a middle schooler and for many years teaching middle school, this was one of those pivotal stories that we taught the kids. And, and the lottery is a short story, right? Correct. So was 
so I'm, I'm thinking of like Truman Capote, um, what was it Baldwin? There's a lot of people who were known for short stories at that time that when I was in school, we kind of went through, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, and they were kind of public intellectuals. They'd be on talk shows mm-hmm. and all sorts of things of that time. And, and I, I would say Shirley Jackson falls into that category. This particular story is m- much less literary and much more uh, Rod Serling short story, in my opinion. Is that- yes. Yes. Yeah absolutely so there's a twist in the lottery that that it's not it's not what you think it is while you're reading it are you are you familiar with the lottery chip do you know the story i I have to go and do a little research and remember it that's just fine you can be in middle school anytime my friend well one day one day one day (laughs) the haunting of hill house is a psychological look at what it means to be in a fear-based situation does it, I mean, this was written in 1959, and it feels very 1959. I have this vision in my head <laughs> of the black and white Vincent Price movie that could be made from this story. You know, are we beatniks here, or are we people in suits and ties? I think yeah. suits and ties, don't you? Well, I mean, it just seems like, you know, you're right on that mm-hmm. sort of era where, you know... Um, Everyone, you know, wanted to fit in and you're, you're going to look at it in this, um, you know, you, you have this esoteric special knowledge in a way. Mm-hmm. And these are people who absolutely dress for dinner, right? So one of the details. Wait, wait, a, minute. wait a minute. Are you saying that you don't? You don't have. <laughs> I, have a, a, I have a white jacket I wear every morning. I mean, every evening with an ascot. Okay. <laughs> Speaking as the only person in a jacket right now, I can tell you, I just got back from school because we're recording this on a Friday night. And yes, I'm dressed for dinner. I I did bring my smoking jacket for later after we finished recording. (laughs) Buying a smoking jacket. And I will say it's the (laughs) the first time I've seen you dressed for dinner, Steve. (laughs) And all the time we've known each other through our long adventure. I've got my shoe full of tobacco right for later on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but one of the details that I find so that I that was really marks the time because haunted house stories they can be a bit timeless, mm-hmm. right? But there are many details that really anchor this in the late 1950s. And one of them is that Eleanor packed some slacks oh. to come to Hill House. Are, do women wear, are women wear allowed to wear pants now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, it is a modern For world. Now. It's, it's a modern world. But she <laughs> had, you know, she had considered, should she bring slacks mm-hmm. or not? Would that be acceptable? And that's one of the sort of anchors that brings you back to the time. Interesting. And, and certainly, you know, think about how casual society is now. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are incredibly casual. I'm wearing a jacket. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a jacket too, Steve. You're wearing a hoodie, Mark Zuckerberg. (laughs) (laughs) So let's get to the plot of this story. You, you, Pam, you've mentioned that this is a haunted house story. This group of people come together to try to find out about the spiritual afterlife. And they have their own set of skills to try to detect the idea of ghosts in this house. And I think it's really important that Dr. Montague, he invites many, many, many people to come to Hill House, which is known to be a haunted house. And he invites all people with some sort of potential supernatural ability. So he's interested in more than just ghosts, Mm -hmm. right? He is interested in psychic phenomena. And as a psychologist, he wants to study the house But he also wants to study these people who have psychic abilities. And it's funny because when you first start reading the novel, you're thinking, oh, yeah, this is going to be sort of like a country um, that like the country manor from Agatha Christie, who's very, very popular at the exact same moment. And it's going to be like an Agatha Christie novel Mm -hmm. in this house that's very separated from society. And instead of murder, there's going to be ghosts. But in fact, only two of the dozen or so people that Dr. Montague invite agree to come. So it's a very small group, in fact. 
which is kind of funny. Like, it feels like she kind of, I don't know, she, she raises this narrative possibility and then pulls back from it. Is she, is she kind of playing against the genre? Because that's, I, mean, I, I immediately was thinking Agatha Christie, right. Blue, um, right. and, and, and basically a, a move forward from like the late 1800s when we were reading the, the Sherlock Holmes where everybody comes and at the end we're like, and this person and that person. And I mean, it's, it's kind of a setup in a way. I think that she was setting us up from the beginning. And I think there were many times in this where I was trying to solve this mystery along with the writing. She was setting me up to be a part of this investigation. And, and that's not how it turned out. Hey, Dinner is <laughs> always at six. <laughs> I clear at two. <laughs> I mean, Mrs. Dudley is everyone's favorite character from this <laughs> no novel. Doubt. I mean, there's, there's no way no around it. No doubt that that the, the <laughs> caretaker of the house, Mrs. Dudley, who is there to do the cooking and the cleaning, and she is sure of what the house needs, and she is darn if she's not going to do exactly <laughs> what she's planning to do in this story. Uh, don't move her cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but also. You know, she's so the way the novel is set up, and this is very, this has been an extremely well received novel, right? My one of my very favorite writers, Stephen King, says it's his favorite horror story, mm -hmm. which is, you know, pretty high praise. I think he says, along with Henry James's Turn of the Screw, which is also wonderful. Um, but but this is one of those stories, the construction of the story is really, really fascinating. And I actually wanted to ask you guys, do you generally, is the haunted house, is that a genre that you like? As a viewer of 1950s film, uh -huh. I enjoy that concept of these strangers coming together and investigating this house. The, the gothic viewpoint of all of this, oh, this is so different from my norm and I'm interested and I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in this situation. That is so well done in this story. And I, I was reading this and I kept thinking of, I, I must have seen this movie, a black and white film. And it's, it was talked about being one of the scariest films. There's no, there's nothing that ever shows up except mm -hmm. for the banging against the wall, all of the and symbolism <laughs> and it gets louder and everybody's frightened and giggling like, like some manic sounds are happening and all the sound design would be fantastic in this. And, and that, that was what the movie was. But once again, it, I think it's this film. I mean, I think it's based off this film, but I don't know. I can't remember. And I want to say that, I mean, I enjoyed this. It wasn't something that I would have sat down and said, oh, I should, should, I should go to this, this book. But now I'm glad I read it mm -hmm. because I think it's very much of its time. And it's certainly grabbed the intellectual, um, uh, you know, writing of the time I and mean, we think about like to kill Lock mockingbird and and um you know any other move um writers of that time it's sort of part of that i don't know uh group of mm -hmm. books that you would go oh i want to read these in my lifetime because these are considered the best of their genre mm -hmm. and i think like the haunted house is really an interesting genre because it speaks to liminality, right? In betweenness. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, one of the great sort of binaries is life and death. In general, someone's either alive or they're not alive. But a ghost. Not quite is dead. I'm both getting better. Dead and alive, right? right. And so. But, but not purgatory, or maybe it is purgatory. Maybe or, that is the definition of purgatory. Right? But but it's all it's it's really it speaks of in betweenness, which is one of my favorite themes, and of course very very common in the Gothic. Right, is putting out all of the assumptions we have about how the world works, and then just turning them slightly to the side. And so this idea of like a haunted house it brings up ghosts, but in the case of Hill House. Hill House was born bad, mm -hmm. we're told, which is really like a funny expression, right? Mm -hmm. And so like Hill House in the construction, the angles were all just a little bit off, just a few degrees off. 
what was it? Was it the Winchester house where the um, the wife, after the passing of the uh, the, the husband, um, continuously built the home hmm. throughout her life? Like she would never stop building it. And there are, I don't know, things that don't go anywhere and, and all sorts of uniqueness. The doors in this house, in Hill House, that, <laughs> that they just can't. They can't fathom how the doors work. They always keep closing and they, they say, we're going to nail these doors open. And, and when they look through a window, they don't see what they're expecting to see outside. But then if you turn just enough degrees to the left, then you see what you were expecting to see. This house was built with all of that in mind. And that's what I really like about the sort of, you know, I'm always thinking about epistemological questions. How do we know what we know, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's part of the pleasure of the haunted house genre is like, what do we know for sure? What do we not know? And this house was built as an experiment, right? But just like this novel is set up as an experiment, right? And so there's this wonderful quote in the novel where I think it's Dr. Montague that says this, no, the menace of the supernatural is that it attacks where modern minds are weakest, where we have abandoned our protective armor of superstition and have no substitute defense. And so this idea in 1959 that we're moving into a more rational world and leaving religion and superstition behind us, then it leaves us with no sort of mechanism to deal with what is unexplained and of course, Dr. Montague has psychology. We have to talk about Mrs. Montague, who's so fascinating, but we'll, we'll wait for her for a minute. <laughs> all, all I'm thinking is that some guy in a, in a um, turtleneck with a, a necklace around his neck with a goatee. And a pipe. Is, yeah, he's, he's this. I mean, this is very much. Mm -hmm. And we talked about they're in suits. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that study of the supernatural versus the psychological is so well done here the whole time the the narrator is telling us i'm not sure if these noises are happening in the house or just in my head can everybody hear these noises that are just in my head they're just in my head right right everyone and, 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 and that was that was brought up a couple times was it uh, yeah and so in fact, there's a question I have. Were the people experiencing it in their head? I mean, it kind of, it could have been either way, right? I I think that that's the point of the story is what's a haunted house? Is a haunted house a doomed building or is it these people who are bringing this emotion into that structure? Ooh. And a gothic novel never answers that question. Right. <laughs> You're right to ask it but the novel will never answer it. And that's the whole point is that it always allows two things to be true at once. Right? It, it, it's, it's either my experience or the experience of one of the characters, or it's the, the group's experience with the, the inanimate object, which is the home. But I just want to note that the way she sets up the novel is really calling upon Gothic traditions. So we read Dracula, I believe, last Halloween. We did, um, as, as that guy was crawling up the side of the castle. I don't drink <laughs> wine. <laughs> and one of the things we discussed in that reading was portents, right? So we spend, I want to say, oh, I don't know, like 15 or 20 percent of this novel with Eleanor before she even arrives to Hill House. I and noticed that. Right? Uh -huh. And on her way, she has a very similar experience to Jonathan Harker, very famously on his way to Castle Dracula, where, you know, she meets someone who says, don't go to the, <laughs> to the house. Yes. And <laughs> Is that is that telling us something? That's so 1959. That is so all of those movies. That that potential. That's not a word, is it? The, 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 those townies. Portentous. Those townies seem to know something. That portentous moment where you are you are being told, turn away. This is evil. Get out. Get out. And where? Right. Exactly. And where? <laughs> when Eleanor meets the girl at the restaurant, 
and it's a terrible restaurant and it's a very unwelcoming. And she's like, how am I even going to drink this coffee? But she's like, oh, what a lovely area. And the girl's like, it's fine, but we don't have a movie theater. And she says it multiple times, right? Like this is a place that's not participating in the entertainment culture of the day. And that's how it stays so gothic, right? I feel like if the town had a movie theater, you couldn't have Hill House. They, they probably don't have cell towers either. <laughs> no cell service. There's no service in this town. It's, it's, 1959. It's, it's rural. <laughs> but then you also have the family who's eating in the diner and the little girl wants her cup of stars mm-hmm. how did you read that well, and it's it, mentioned it, many many times and, and, and drink the milk and, and, and at drink. the bottom is the stars that show up uh-huh Th- that was that was did it need to be in the mo- in, in the uh, movie did it need to be in the in the novel that's what a what an interesting scene. It's it's an interesting study in psychology, child psychology. This little girl wants what she wants, and she's not going to be satisfied with anything else. This book is all about the mind and and our needs and how we perceive things. That little girl thought that was important. Interesting. And Eleanor. Eleanor thinks about the cup of stars many times at Hill House too, right? It's not like that isn't just dropped. Mm-hmm. And so like, what does the cup of stars mean? That's just like, it's a dream, right? It's a, it's an imagined future. Is it referring to science fiction, to going to the stars, to understanding? You know, I think that all of these little symbols, mm-hmm. they're all sort of connected in these different ways of knowing. And, to and, me, and, that's what's at the center. And I'm thinking about how little I sat down and read about what other people thought about this book. Because if I did, mm-hmm. maybe there's some connections that that I was going through the first reading that certainly I, I just didn't. I didn't grab the insight. I absolutely did not do any research into this book before I read it. I was I was wanting very much to go into this adventure knowing nothing. Pam has noted our ignorance many times. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's why she's here. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> no, but you guys, but now that we're talking about it, don't you think this would be a really easy book to write? you know, a 10 page paper following through one, one image. Like there's so yes. many things. Is, is, that bites. is that an assignment? <laughs> <laughs> I want your it. papers. I've got, <laughs> I'll send on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to candy up and we're going to get this done. <laughs> but you guys, I can tell you easily because of course I teach this book. So I, I can certainly tell you that um, there's a ton of scholarship on this book and it's mm-hmm. super fun to read because and, and it's it's a scholarship that's really my favorite kind of scholarship because no one disagrees with anyone else. The scholars who write about this, they always acknowledge many, many, many readings and then provide another one hmm. because there's no reason to ever turn away from a reading. All of the readings, it just invites a multiplicity of perspectives. And, and I love a- that. And, and that's, I got that when I was reading it, is yeah. that I said, there's something bigger here and you, you know, you can kind of play with it in your mind. And what do you want to do? You, you want, you want to battle this in your mind for a little while. And you brought up dreams a few sentences back and the idea of dreams and how dreams are an interpretation of what is happening around you is so well illustrated here where she is in this dream and she hears her name and she wakes up and somebody's saying her name and how, you know, where is that psychology here? Well, and of course, the very opening, the super, super famous opening line of the novel is, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Why why did you put on black lights, Steve? Let me do it. Whoa, man. <laughs> this, is, this is psychological. This is this is certainly a, a study in thinking. But you guys, in 1959, we didn't have the evidence we have today that animals do dream, mm-hmm. right? There have been recent studies that really, really changed the way we think about animal consciousness of animals dreaming. But well, here- even, even go to the trees 
communicating with each other yeah, and keeping a that's stump, the best. Yeah. keeping a stump alive mm -hmm. and then knowing that some tree needs some nutrient and i don't know around the forest they bring it to you mm -hmm. Here's or even, even what um even what uh all right you know fungus and, and how it relates to us and maybe even how um other organisms impact our reality or our perception of reality mm -hmm. But the idea that no one can stay sane if they live only in reality, right? You cannot exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. That's just awesome. <laughs> and that's how the brain works, though, isn't it? Because if you took in all the information around oh, you, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do it. You, you have learned as an adult. Well, this is where the childlike wonder comes in. A child sees things that as an adult, you don't see mm -hmm. because you're either you have more experience or whatever that is. You're somehow trying to focus. Fo yeah, there you go. Fo focus. Focus, Steve. The idea of focus, we, we talked about this last month with upgrade. And if we had the ability to see and hear everything, it might drive us crazy. That, that we have to filter out some of what our oh, reality is. Absolutely. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we can't even yeah. see all the colors, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that we just have such a tidy group at Hill House, right? Mm -hmm. So we have Dr. Montague and then the three guests, Eleanor and Theo, who like, mustard. <laughs> may, exactly. But they may or may not have some sort of supernatural abilities. Theo may be telepathic and Eleanor may have some telekinetic abilities. And then we have Luke who represents the family who owns Hill House. And so I actually, one of the scenes that I really paused at, and I pause at it every time I read this novel is when Dr. Montague, the first night he's like, Oh, I don't want to tell you anything about the house until we've all had a good night's sleep. And they're like, no, 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 no. You have to tell us something. So finally he says, okay, I will start to share. And then the faces of Eleanor, Theo and Luke fall into a typical rapturous classroom pose. And I'm sorry, but this totally makes me laugh out loud. Now, Steve, you and I teach all the time. Chip, I, you teach a fair bit in your life as well. You know how that often, face. How often do you see the rapture of your children? I see that face. You do, I, I love that. That happens in my class. I, I, I just started a new quarter. The first few days of my, my class, the kids are like, okay, I am getting new information that I did not have before. Please tell me more. And I'm like, nope, the, the class is ended. Go on, uh, go in peace. And they're like, no, no, no. What about? <laughs> Same bat time. <laughs> Same <laughs> bat channel. We'll see you tomorrow. There. I'm sure you get there in your classes. So I must admit that in college classes, I wouldn't always describe people's interactions as rapturous, but um, I do think that stories, right? It's like mm -hmm. stories are what really get people in that space. And the childlike wonder that you were just talking about, Chip. So, but the idea like, oh, I'm going to get a story. Mm -hmm. That's what gets you excited and that's what they're they're here for the story within the novel that is the story that we are reading did you just say they're here <laughs> seriously in the middle of this story okay so we have to talk about poltergeist for just a just a minute here because the the term poltergeist is mentioned and as a, a child of the 80s poltergeist was a, a big haunted house story sure a little um a, a little bit of Steven Spielberg coming in. There. A little Steven Spielberg, but a little horror and a little fear about what is happening. I don't understand what's happening. Do we have a lady with a with a, a strange voice who's okay. very small playing an organ? So I'm not sure if I could tell the joke from the 80s about Poltergeist, but do you remember Eddie Murphy telling the joke about when... Get out. Get out. Too bad we can't stay, baby. <laughs> 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 Strangely, I kind of do remember that. <laughs> He's like, uh, yeah, uh, we, we can't stay here. It's a beautiful house. We we have to leave. <laughs> but I'll just go, uh, we'll just go a little treehouse of horror. The first one was where the house chooses to die rather than live with the Simpsons. 
uh, Marge Simpson kind of uh, addresses like, you're not going to treat us this way. And so and the house destroys itself I've, rather I've, than live with the Simpsons. I've got to think about this. And he goes, hmm, life with the Simpsons. <laughs> so you guys, after we get our four people who are experiencing the house and experiencing the Dudleys, which are awesome, then suddenly, six days in, Mrs. Montague and Arthur, <laughs> just Arthur, show up. Oh, Arthur. Oh I, my I almost forgot about Arthur. You can't forget about Arthur, Steve. Come on. Well, Mrs. Montague is so much to take in. And, and then there's Arthur. Uh, in, in my brain, I'm thinking of Thurston Howell the Thirds. Mrs. Howell is uh, playing this woman. Oh, I, I don't see that. I think, I think that she is much more uh, the wife of the mayor in... Uh, the music man just overbearing, overwhelming. I, I got a little bit of an Arthur Pewdy sort of vibe to it. Uh, I got a whole like Walter Mitty feeling here. Mm -hmm. Like, like Dr. Montague was the powerful man, and then his wife shows up and he is knocked down. She is in charge. Well, and it's interesting because he's sort of the father figure to these three much younger people, and he's the psychologist and he's in charge. Heart. But then not only does Mrs. Montague arrive and like turn everything upside down, she brings <laughs> Arthur, she brings like a husband figure with her. So mm -hmm. suddenly he's sort of turned into one of the children, right? So like that sort of family, that that very common gothic family that's always missing a mother, right? That is a total trope of the gothic family. The mother died. When the children were were born, um, that's, that's the Disney effect. That's right, exactly. <laughs> run, Bambi, run! Then it sort of reshapes all of a sudden, and the the house feels so much less haunted with Mrs. Montague in it. Am I right? Well, she's the haunting at <laughs> that point. Dealing with her, <laughs> exactly. Of her like <laughs> she's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and she's so funny, and that's the other thing is that. This is a very, very scary story in a lot of ways. And it's a very dark story. Because if you think about Eleanor and Eleanor's mindscape, it's a very, very dark story. But there's a lot of humor in it between the Dudleys and Mrs. Montague. And frankly, Arthur's hilarious as well. <laughs> And that is very 1959. Back again yeah. to the, the black and white movie era that we're talking about. That ability for a story to have those comic moments. That's very Shakespearean. Shakespeare was excellent at having these mm -hmm. dark moments followed by a very comedic comic relief. Well, and there's a picnic, you know. <laughs> the picnic. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I might constitute the picnic as a darker moment. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and we are along for the ride trying to solve what is happening in this i was trying to solve this from the beginning trying to figure out what was going to be knowing shirley jackson and the lottery and that that twist we, we were playing the mail steve mm -hmm. we're just trying to solve it just just trying to solve it that twist i was expecting this whole time for this to be a rod serling twilight zone twist and i'm like aha chapter five i have the evidence this is what's really going on nope Nope, I was wrong. But it was kind of before that, right? That that is something that's a, that's a trope that comes a little bit later. Like deconstruction comes later on too. So this is just like we're telling the story. It is that it is very straight, but at the same time, it's so rooted in psychology that your mind is trying to solve this along with the characters and, and isn't that the crazy part about being a good writer mm -hmm. is to get your the wheels spinning so you're actually reading but you're like you're like working around outside uh -huh. of the story trying to like okay where where is this going mm -hmm. and much more than other gothic stories i think this is one that really cognitively engages you in the same way as a detective story. So I think exactly what you've just said, Steve, that you don't just sit back and see what, what's going to jump out of the closet next. You are trying to come up with a rational explanation. I love the word rational. The, there's so many things that are just 
just irrational. Right. You can't talk your way in or out of. It just is the way the mind works. And I think that when it comes to our main character, Eleanor or Nell, it's, I mean, in some ways, this is just the really tragic story of a young woman's decline, right? Mm -hmm. And she's someone who, and this is not unusual, uh, probably even today, but certainly in this period, um, she's someone who has really not lived a particularly interesting life. She has taken care of her mother until her mother's death. She blames herself for her mother's death, even suggesting she may have heard her mother asking for medicine at the end oh, and, yeah. and let her go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there is this suggestion that she had these sort of telekinetic abilities as a child. Their family was somewhat outcast from the community because of it, mm. but she never like pursues that. She doesn't pursue anything. The first, yes. This is the first thing she's ever pursued. She's 32 years old. And so she's just this very, very sad character. And one of her taglines, really interesting, is journeys end in lovers meeting. I don't know how many times this shows up in the novel. Many. 15, 20. Mm-hmm. I mean, she thinks it constantly. And so she's so desperate to have, she, she has no one right? Mm -hmm. Her sister dislikes her. She dislikes her sister. She dislikes her niece. She dislikes her brother-in-law. And those are the three people she knows. She doesn't have a job, as she told Theo. She she doesn't have an apartment with a little white cat. She lives, she she stays on a cot in her... She she had like a box of stuff that was all... That was all... That's all all she's got. Her possessions, yeah. All right. right. And she doesn't have a home, right? All right. So, but is this going on in her mind or is this reality? doesn't matter well it, it is the discussion of of the story that is that's the whole story is is how much of a haunted house is in the minds of the people and the whole story you know but you, she but she takes action on that mm-hmm. and that, i don't think that i don't know I, I, this is my first time reading it i don't know if that's resolved because it's just like she decides she's going to take action mm-hmm and she's sort of like, I'm free, I'm free, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But but Chip, journeys end in lovers meeting. Mm-hmm. So at the end of this story, who does Eleanor meet? How does her journey end? Mm-hmm. She meets death. Mm-hmm. Right? And maybe all the ghosts in the house. Right? And so this is like, you know, and there's a young man provided because Theo, it's it's very interesting. Theo, the lesbian character, right? And so that's this is kind of an early. Lesbian think about character. that. That is, I immediately thought that too. Mm-hmm. That boy, this is kind of forward thinking. Yeah. Of. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, and very positively portrayed. And mm-hmm. and you know, so so Luke appears to be this potential lover for Eleanor, similar age. He saves her from the tower you know, when she's becomes a damsel in distress. But at the end, the lover that she meets is death itself, right? Mm. And that's that's the only lover for such a sad character. It's a very tragic story. So let's let's grab a tissue. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's if, so I, if, I, if I had some feelings, I, yeah. mean, I could probably feel something. There, there's so much in this story. It is so much more than Poltergeist, that, that haunted house story. It's got that literature writing and, and so many things to think about. And, and, and you're right, because Poltergeist is this journey and you're going along with it. This is a story that has a story to it, but you're a participant in it in a different way. And so many questions, so many questions for you and your thinking and how your psychology affects your choices. This is good, Pam. This it's is not bad, this is, right? <laughs> this is excellent. It's it's pretty frequently taught and so much fun to talk about, you know, because everyone brings what everyone it invites us to bring our own perspectives. And this is a great group read that you could revisit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
you could certainly revisit this. This I absolutely this is a book that you could read over and over again and get different things out of it just like you have, Pam. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more great quotes that you want to share? Well, of course, it does have a great ending. Oh, there's an so ending? <laughs> Journeys end. So, you guys, I know meeting. that I never like to talk about endings, but I think just for this once, we'll make an exception. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love that it ends with Hill House and, again, the personification of the house, right? Which brings us back to the House of Usher by Poe over 100 years earlier, where that house is personified using many of the same techniques. So, no, so this is where Steve and I look at each other and go, of course. Uh, no, oh, I, I know course. I know the fall of the House of Usher, my friend. Thank you very much. <laughs> another <laughs> another <laughs> excellent <laughs> middle school read, I would <laughs> say. <It's another> right? <laughs> Have I ever told you about the time that I saw a one-man play about Edgar Allan Poe portrayed by John Aston of the Adams family? Yes, Whoa. sir. Thank you very much. Wow. It was phenomenal. What were you saying, Pam? <laughs> did, 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 was it in French? <laughs> I was going to go to the end of this novel, my friends. Are we ready? Yes. <laughs> so it ends with the house and the personification of the house. Hill House itself, not sane, stood against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, its walls continued upright. Bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House. And whatever walked there, walked alone. So much there, right? So first so of all, much. we have the idea that the house itself is not sane, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not just Eleanor. It's not just, it's, you know, she has presumably lost her mind, lost her grip on reality, but it's not just her. The house itself is insane. And then, but we have it standing on and the characters fantasize multiple times about the house burning, hmm. but it doesn't burn. Didn't you expect it kind of, didn't you kind of expect it to go up in flames considering would, how many times people said that? Yes. There's so many things that I expected that I, that I thought, aha, I discovered it. I, th I discovered <laughs> and, and nope, the Shirley Jackson was not going to give me that satisfaction. And well, then, she, that's the point is she just, yes. she just lays it out there. Uh -huh. as a, I shouldn't say an expectation as a possibility mm -hmm. and just, well, but I think I would say expectation ship. Like she raises all of these genre expectations, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then at the end, whatever walks there walks alone. Well, what walks there? Is it now Eleanor? Right? I mean. Is it, is it the, the psychology of the genre? Is it the psychology of uh, life and finding yourself and, and having a place? And does Eleanor have a place now? Well, 2039, that would be the 80 years. Ooh, I like that, Chip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Da, da, da. We'll have to read this again in 2039, my friends. All right. <laughs> Make a note. <laughs> I know you keep let's, a calendar. You have to write those endings right there. You have to write it again. <laughs> It'll be the, the modern people showing up. So there <laughs> is. Without dinner jackets, because they don't use dinner jackets. <laughs> Except Steve. I have a jacket on. I'm the only one with a jacket on. With an ascot. I don't have an ascot. <laughs> Zoinks. <laughs> so those meddling kids will show up. So you mentioned, Pam, that there is at least one media interpretation of this. There is the series that would that hit Netflix, and that was an interesting interpretation, very different from the story that came out in 2018. And and so many 1950s movies have some of these themes, but none of them approach all of the psychology here. And you guys, I thought that series was excellent. And mm -hmm. here's why. It's a very, very good spooky haunted house kind of series, right? It's very updated. It focuses on Hugh Crane, the man who built the house in the first place, and his family. And so it's just by itself. It's an excellent haunted house eight or ten episode series sure 
but it also has so many little Easter eggs for those of us who know the book really well. So it takes a completely different approach, right? But it has all of these references that make you go, oh, that's so much fun. So if you do like the novel, it is so worth watching that series. And if you've never even read the novel, also a very good series. I thought it was terrific. And it's got Elliot from E.T. in it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yes. He's all grown up. <laughs> <laughs> Is he playing with Star Wars figure? <laughs> not in 1959. He's not. So. Get. So this this was so much fun pam thank you so much for bringing this book to us uh it, it's a perfect analysis of that genre of the haunted house we've gone through now dracula frankenstein haunted houses we, we, we'll have to figure out something new for next october well it seems like henry james the turn of the screw that might is, be yeah. is also a stephen king favorite mm -hmm. yes. it's from 1898 which uh puts us right in the uh Back in the Victorian? Yeah, back in the Doyle. <laughs> okay. Daphne I wonder if we can find an expert. Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca is also a very good gothic haunted house. Ah, now we've got a book list. All right. Pam, thank you so much for joining us for our October read-along. I hope everybody out there enjoyed it as well. That is The Haunting of Hill House, 1959 by Shirley Jackson. Ooh. Scroll with it. Brings us to our scroll with it. There's plenty of stuff happening in the world. Let's talk about almost none of it, Chip. Steve, um, many people who have streaming services mm -hmm. have children that go away to college. Mm -hmm. And they bring their streaming service with them. Mm -hmm. That could be a challenge going with uh, if you have Netflix. Well, yeah, Netflix has been saying that they are going to crack down on password sharing. They want every viewer to pay them money for that right to see that material. Steve, are you saying people share passwords? People share passwords for Netflix? This is news. Well, this is news, but I didn't realize they did. But um, for those family members, I guess they have to be in the house. Mm -hmm. There, there's certainly going to be a crackdown here. A global crackdown. Sharing your passwords for Netflix is going to cost you very soon. If you remember, a few years ago, the HBO CEO at the time, which is not the current HBO CEO, hmm. was very like, "You can share whatever you want to share." We are happy that you are watching our material. Please talk about it. Please tell us what we're doing. Please share this whole opportunity. But, you know, on the grand scheme of things, you, you are taking revenue away from the company so by sharing. Are you saying that HBO is not doing well right now? No, well, no, they're oh, not. Oh, <laughs> oh. Well, they're not. But re regardless, um, the, the point being is that uh, people have become very um, casual with mm -hmm. uh, sharing passwords and things of that nature. And Netflix is going to attempt to do a crackdown on that. The question is, is, you know, will there be a fight back? And, you know, the question is, you know, whether they're going to be able to fund new projects. The value of those subscriptions versus the value of goodwill toward their customers. That's the balancing act that all of these streaming services go through. And Netflix sees the numbers and, and wants to crack down. And it's a very crowded market right now. Mm -hmm. And you, we're going to see, I mean, we're already seeing things like Peacock and, and Paramount Plus and, and Amazon uh, Prime. Apple TV Plus, you've got so many of these streaming services that it's very difficult. I mean, if you have a special show mm -hmm. and it's being shown on Stars or Showtime or whatever it is, the chances of people picking up that special yeah. uh, subscription or even people knowing about it is, and, and that there's a real challenge with Netflix right now is how they release their uh, programming um, doesn't allow for buildup. Mm -hmm. it's all released for the moment so you can watch the latest show it's released all at once are you binging it like you did during the pandemic maybe not mm -hmm. but certainly it's there and then it's gone it's forgotten about at least yeah. and and they may have to reconsider this I, I don't think the app supported 
version that they're coming out with is going to be the answer to what they want. Right. I think they're going to do what HBO has done. And that's basically release the show weekly. Hmm. And there you go. It's going to be a six week show. You're going to have to have at least two months to be able to do that. And guess what? The next show starts the following mm -hmm. week and it's going to be a hot show and you're going to want to be part of that. And, and that's you, how you build it. And then you're locked in for another two months. That That is that is what the successful streaming services have been able to do for sure. Well, uh, yeah, at least uh, t attempting that. Mm -hmm. it, we'll see how that works out over time. I think it's a very crowded market. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of stuff is just going to just start falling by the wayside because it's going to be a lot easier to get that NBA uh, pass mm -hmm. and watch the games that you want to watch than to sit around and fumble with a, you know, a hundred dollar service or a $15 service or whatever it is right. for like, uh, and, and subscribe to like 10 of those. And then we'll see what happens with the NFL next year when that service becomes something different than the direct TV. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. And you, we've already seen what Amazon Prime, how they benefited by having NFL. Mm -hmm. Listen, once they teach you how to do it, mm -hmm. it changes. No doubt. It changes how, how you watch television. I agree. There's going to be some change. Uh, it's October. It's time for uh, all the spooky change that's going around right now. We want to thank our, our dear friend, Pam Bedore, for coming in and discussing The Haunting of Hill House. That's, that is such a fun, deep literary book. Steve, we're, we're already smarter. Oh, we are smarter. I feel smarter now than I did a, a few hours At ago. At least one point. <laughs> For Gryffindor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Chip. I think we have enough information to survive another week. What do you think? Only if we can come back next week, Steve. I hope so. We would love to hear from you. Give us a call or a text. Our phone number is 805-4104-TMS. Our website is too much scrolling.com. Our email is too much scrolling at gmail.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We're on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and YouTube. And you can always ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of Too Much Scrolling. I want to thank you again for listening to Too Much Scrolling. I'm Steve Fodor. I'm Trapass and Flood. Good. <laughs> Are we having Gulag? <laughs> we'll see you in the future.